What's the word, y'all? We are back to talk about game twos. Two game slate. The Cavs hold the Boston Celtics to under 100 points and take game two. And the Dallas Mavericks go into OKC and also take game number two. Them uh, taking home court advantage from the higher seed. I'm here for it. Let's talk about the first game. Um, like I mentioned, the, the Boston Celtics failed to hit 100 points. Now, this is very similar to their last series, right, where game number two comes around. The Miami Heat go out and hit 23 made threes, the most three-pointers in their franchise history, at least playoffs go, and uh, the Boston Celtics fall. Um, it's just so weird to see the disconnect for the Celtics at some times. In the regular season, this team at home was 37-4. and four. I vividly remember turning on TV. Maybe I don't remember it as vivid as now I'm saying it, but I remember turning on the TV and I don't know, I don't remember if it was Fox Sports or ESPN, one of the big sports networks. They were having a little conversation before they went to commercial about the Boston Celtics on whether or not this team was good enough to go 41 and 0 at home. That's how dominant they have been. Again, they lost four total games at home in the entire entire season. But we get to the playoffs you lose game number two to the Miami Heat. You lose game number two to the Cleveland Cavaliers. And I saw a stat that over the last three years in TD Garden, that team is 14 and 14 at home. How is that even possible? How can we be the most dominant home team in all of basketball by four total games and then go into the playoffs and look like this at home? It doesn't make sense to me. The reason you win all the games to be 14 games ahead of your competition as the one seed is that you know when you get into a game seven, you got to come to our house and get it done. And over the last three years, teams have gone. The teams have gone to the TD Garden and got things done. And the Cleveland Cavaliers were a team to do that more recently. Um, I actually thought JB Bickerstaff coached a really good game in this one. And this might have been just minor for me, but there was a time where Evan Mobley got into some foul trouble. And um, JB Bickerstaff opted to not go his traditional route because again, Jared Allen's gone, but traditional route of going George Niang in. And George Niang definitely hit or miss. More miss so far in the playoffs than hit. So he he opted to bring in TT, Tristan Thompson. Tristan Thompson, man, how much burn have we got over Tristan, for Tristan Thompson over the last couple months? He came in, and I'm looking at the stats. It was 10.00 field goals. I mean, it was three rebounds. Lord knows he wasn't that impactful. But it was cool to see J.B. Biggerstaff make some adjustments on the fly. I think the Cavaliers are be the best version of themselves when it isn't Donovan Mitchell having to be Superman. Like in game number six versus the Orlando Magic where he needed to drop 50, and they still ended up losing. Game number seven, it worked because they were down by 18. Donovan Mitchell turned to Superman and ended up winning that game. But it was... It was so cool to see like Darius Garland have a good game, like hitting his three-point shots. It was so good to see Karis LeVert and both of these teams that won today had somebody come off their bench and give them a, a perfect performance. Tim Hardaway Jr. in the, the game we're going to talk about in a little bit. And then in this one, Karis LeVert. So Karis LeVert was great. Darius Garland was great. Donovan Mitchell was great. And Evan Mobley. This Is this Evan Mobley's best playoff game of his short career? Probably, right? 21 points, 10 rebounds, 5 assists, 2 blocks of steal. Uh, we're going to talk about Jason Tatum in a minute here but anytime somebody got like the Boston Celtics sometimes could be a team that's so not sometimes all the time are a team that's so heavily in love with a three-point shot that's just what they do but in the first quarter I vividly remember Jason Tatum beating his man off the dribble get into the basket which is what you want him to do and then Evan, Evan Mobley's back there and I don't think he got a block on either of those possessions but he made it so tough that we saw misses from Jason Tatum like that's what Evan Mobley provided for today and now we have a series like I mean part part of fans are gonna be like hey this is the same thing that happened in Miami and then the Boston Celtics came out and dominated them for the rest of the series. And that's still a possibility. And this, the Celtics are the better team. But this Cavs team, they're, they're feisty. They're fighters. They have more talent than the Miami Heat team. Those missing Jimmy Butler, Duncan Robinson, T Terry Rozier. Who else? Who else? It's everybody. You know, so they have more talent. Um, and in this one, they outshot the Celtics. The Celtics were 8 of 35. It's one of my pet peeves about the season, man. It's just one of my pet peeves. And again, you win as many games as you do doing this. I can't. I guess I can't be mad at it long term. But a game like this, when the three point shot is just not falling. And last game, Derek White hit seven three pointers. Today, he was one of eight. I just want to see more variety on the offensive side of the ball. I, this is pretty much what I've said the entirety of Joe Mazzulla's tenure. Like, yes, when it's flowing, there's nobody that can stop it. But when you have these games where things aren't looking as good, I just want them to be a little bit more aggressive, getting downhill. And a lot of conversation on Twitter is about Jason Tatum right now, who had 25 points, six assists, seven rebounds. Those numbers aren't as great uh, or they're, they're better than what the game said. You know what I'm saying? If you were watching this game, it wasn't a great Jason Tatum game. And I mentioned this on my podcast that the way teams have been guarding Jason Tatum in the playoffs is just different. Um, they're sending multiple bodies a lot of these times. And, and like the superstar players know how to adjust and know how to kill even when you're sending those multiple bodies. I think so far in the series, Tatum 
has been as composed as can be when those second eyes and third eyes and bodies come his way, making the right pass and eventually leads to an open shot. And this one, he got six assists. He, I don't know what the the like um, potential assist would have been, but I thought he was very composed when he got that second guy and kicked it out to the next dude who happened to be Drew Holiday sometimes. And playoff Drew so far has not been good. Um, but you still do want that superstar player, which is what Jason Tatum needs to be if they want to win this championship, ultimately be able to adjust where it's not just, okay, here's the second body. I'm making the right basketball play. I know it sounds stupid, but sometimes you just want that star to be the star and Tatum hasn't done that. And in this, in this game, what I thought he was good with when they didn't send that second body, when it was just him one-on-one -on -one with Max Drews and boy, has Max Drews been guarding very, very good in this series. I thought Tatum's aggression when it was just him in space versus Max Drews, he attempted to beat him off the dribble attempted to create his own shot but Max Struess has just been phenomenal defensively so far in the series so it's just harder you know what I'm saying um but yeah the Boston Celtics should recover this is the better team in the grand scheme but the Celtics are not going to go out without a fight and that's great Drew Holiday man you, you know things are rough when they put out the Kai Sinet video the Kai Sinet versus kids video because uh, Drew Holiday has had a lot of ups and downs in this playoff tenure. You can ask Bucks fans about it, right? They experienced it live for the last couple of seasons where you can see him be at one of the most impactful regular season players. And in the playoffs, his true shooting percentage drops by like 12% or something crazy like that. Um, but he's also prone to give you one game where he's like, here's 20 plus points and you're going to win that game. So you, you get some, you take some. I thought in this one, Peyton Pritchard gave them a nice performance. But nonetheless, shout out to the Cavaliers for evening up the series. And now they got to go back to Cleveland and get a win. Let's talk about the Dallas Mavericks getting this one. Because the last time we talked about them, um, when we, we talked about OKC beating them and dominating them in the third quarter and the fourth quarter to, to grow that lead and end up being a blowout. We talked about how Luka Doncic had to spring knee and how Luka didn't move the same way. Where in this one, he opened up the game, I think, 16 points in the first quarter. And then in the second quarter, he scored like two. He was back laboring. There was multiple times in this game where he was holding his knee. He held his ankle at one point. Um, like, he is go he is going through a lot in this one, but he still gave us a 29-10-10 game. And in the fourth quarter, being the, the Luka Doncic that we know making the right plays and also hitting some big-time shots down the stretch. P.J. Washington, P.J. Washington, P.J. Washington. After the brother hit his fifth three-and-a-half, I'm just hoping that we change this up the scheme so he's not completely wide open. VJ Washington giving them seven threes is what they needed tonight because Kyrie did not have it going at all. Again, Kyrie has been a really damn good defender in this one. I thought his, his playmaking was good today, but the jump shot was not falling so much so that he stopped looking for it eventually and he became very passive. And maybe passive is the wrong word, but he became more of a traditional point guard and finding PJ and in finding Josh Green, who was phenomenal today, and finding Tim Hardaway Jr., was that last time we talked? I, I always get it mixed up. Was I talking about it on this channel? Was I talking about it on the podcast? I don't really know. What well, Tim Hardaway Jr. is is Jason Kidd's buddy healed, right? Where, boy, he can be really, really bad. But all he need is a couple shots to go in, and he going to start feeling it. And that was today. He got fouled on two three-pointers, I want to say. One of them went in for a four-point play that he missed a free throw. And the other time, um, he hit all three free throws. So it's like... When you have that type of umph off your bench, it's going to be a hard team to defeat, especially if Luka Doncic is doing this. Again, I feel like he's still not 100%, but if you can give me 29 or not 100%, you'll take that. Only one turnover today. Uh, and that was with him having a second quarter and early third quarter where he was pretty much non, non, not a factor. Um, also, again, I, I just the Gafford minutes are cool. Gafford is a, is a really good player. I just hate when he gets the ball and he has to make a decision other than scoring. <laughs> like the short row, there was a few times uh, with this entire season, one of my favorite things about Derek Lively is his decision making, where if he's on a short row, he has the ability to go up and straight up dunk on your head. He has a floater, but he also has the vision to kick it out in the corner. Daniel Gafford don't have it like that. So sometimes they're giving him the ball a little bit too early in a pick and roll, and he's either got to put the ball on the floor or make a play. And a couple times he tried to make that play and ended up in a turnover. And I'm just like, ah, it's a little bit too early on that pass. But like I mentioned, Josh Green gave them phenomenal minutes. Tim Hardaway Jr., phenomenal minutes. And if you're getting that, and then plus a P.J. Washington 29, which is something you shouldn't rely on, by the way. <laughs> the Mavericks shouldn't be going into game number three and be like, yeah, P.J.'s good for 29. But in a seven-game series where every single one of these quarters, minutes matter, where you could get a role player having a career, Career night, you take that because the next three get now you only got to win three games instead of four, you know. And in this one for the OKC Thunder, very apparent, very, very apparent, very early on. Josh Giddy can't play, he just cannot play. 
They do not trust them. It makes it crazy. It makes it tough. And the times that they went on their runs, because there was times where they were down by a lot, when uh, Jalen Williams came into the game in the first quarter, boom, instant run. And now that I think it was like a 11, 12 point lead is back down to four because Josh Giddy is on the bench. Josh Giddy comes back in the game and there's another run for the Dallas Mavericks because it just mucks it up so much on the offensive side of the ball for the Thunder because he is not a guy that needs to be guarded. No, they weren't guarding Jalen Williams for three, but guess what he did? He made two threes to keep him honest. And the same thing happened with Isaiah Joe in game number one. Same thing happened with Eric Wiggins in game number one as well, that when... Josh Giddy went to the bench. That is when things open up. I talked about a little bit on my podcast that it feels like maybe the Achilles heel for the Dallas Mavericks defensively is when you really go spread. All five guys out there can be a jump shooter. And you saw a little bit today. You saw a little bit today. You saw it definitely a game number one. I thought that this, uh, the Dallas Mavericks did a decent job of kind of hiding that a little bit. But I don't know how you can start. Well, you could probably start Josh Giddy. But you got to have a short lease, Mark Daynaw. We talked about in game number one, one of the coolest things about the OKC Thunder is that they can run a 10-man rotation and still bust your ass. Uh, let's start shorting the rotation. And I'm not saying Josh Giddey's the guy out. But why is Gordon Hayward playing basketball? <laughs> Gordon Hayward. Uh, let me see. How many total minutes? Oh, let's go. Let's quickly look. Gordon Hayward so far in the playoffs um, has not done a single damn thing. In the playoffs so far. <laughs> I cannot believe how he's getting minutes and just running. So he has a total of uh, 19 minutes, 16 minutes. Oh, shit. He has a total of about 37 minutes. And, and he has not scored. Today he played four. He got a foul, a rebound, and an assist. The coach said, come sit right next to me. You can cut those minutes out. Get those minutes to Wiggs. Give those minutes to Kasich because those guys are the better players. Give it to Isaiah Joe. They're the better players. Um, one thing that happened very early in this game, which was interesting, is that we saw Chet Holmgren and Jalen Williams play together. In a regular season, they only played 92 minutes together. In a game number one, they played two minutes together. And I think in this game, they played two minutes together as well. I wonder what the numbers say about those two minutes because it felt like it was kind of working a little bit. Um, so Mark Daynall got to figure some things out. Jason Kidd and company got a huge, huge win. And just like that, both of these series are back tied. One to one. Uh, it's, a best, it's a best of five from this point out. And guess what? The Cavs have home court advantage. Guess what? The Dallas Mavericks have home court advantage. Home court advantage. You, let you, you let me know what you think about these games. Um, that's fun. I can't wait till tomorrow.